The world of publishing has changed so much in the last 25 years. We hear the term hybrid publishing. What does that mean? And why might that be important for you to help you get your book of the heart out into the world? Well, today's guest is a hybrid publisher, and she's going to explain what that means and why it's important for you. Stay tuned. Welcome to Page One, the award-winning show for writers with the reader in mind. That, that draws the reader along just like fiction. Here's your host and producer, Zeta Christian. My guest is Corey Wamsley from Aurora Corealis Publishing, and she knows all about hybrid publishing. Corey, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me on. So to lay the groundwork, because for a lot of us, the term hybrid publishing is new, even though it's been around for a long time. Give me an overview of how publishing has changed in, let's say, the last couple of decades. Sure. Um, so a lot of times we have basically three different choices. We have traditional publishing, which is like the big publishing houses in New York. Um, we have independent publishing, which I think most people have heard of by this point. That's where an author is able to upload their book to a platform online and publish themselves. And then we also have hybrid publishing, which is kind of the best of both worlds. Um, so it's the professionalism of a traditional publishing house, but it's also the speed and the um, control that you would have with independent publishing. Um, a hybrid house like us, we provide the editing, the book cover, the layout, all these different pieces um, with professionals who actually handle these things all the time um, instead of you having to go around and hunt for these people by yourself. So that's a nice thing about hybrid publishing, um, the author pays for all the services too. So they would be able to pay for a package um, and the pricing varies on that depending on who you work with and what's included. Um, but the nice thing is you have all of it in one place. So you don't have to hunt people down. You don't have to figure things out. Um, I know from my experience when I was trying to figure out the whole publishing piece um, over a decade ago, when I first published my books, um, I had access to editors. I worked with editors. So it was very easy for me to find people who could edit my book. However, I had to figure out, you know, who do I hire for uh, the cover? What, what's a good price? Is that too much? Is that too little? Do they know what they're doing? Um, are they going to ask me questions that I clearly wasn't thinking about because I'm the writer, I'm not a cover designer. Um, so there are all these things that I had to figure out and then put those pieces together. That way, when people come to me, they know they're getting a professional job on this. Um, it's not just a bunch of people that I kind of cobbled together and was like, oh, hurry up and do this stuff. Um, and I think that's the nice thing about hybrid publishing is it's a place you can go with trusted professionals um, that you can pay to have the speed of independent publishing, but also have that professional work. I think that's I think that's brilliant. I find that for so many of us who were in and I belong to several writers groups who were traditionally published, now we've got the rights to our books back and we're looking to do some other form of publishing. Mm -hmm. Hybrid publishing to me says somebody else has vetted all of these other yeah. editors, cover designers, formatters. Somebody else has done all that. So I don't have to I don't have to learn all that part of a business to get my book out. So I, I think that there's a, you went over it, but I think each, each piece of it is, is a nugget of gold and so valuable for a writer who has the book, which just wants to get the book out into the world and be able to have people read it. When, when someone works with Aurora Corealis publishing, does the book come out in both the electronic ebook, but also in a paper version, or is that even a possibility? Yeah, um, we handle both of those types. Um, there are some hybrid houses that will only handle one or the other, mm -hmm. and there are others that would handle both of those plus a hardback or plus an audio book. So, um, you know, if somebody's looking at a hybrid house, I suggest that you ask, you know, what it is that they help you with and what different formats your book will come out in. Uh, that's a very good idea. Always ask questions. Mm -hmm. So, in, in 
to my mind then, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the idea is that the the author makes a, an investment, a financial investment to have the book, um, to have the book created, the cover, the editing, whatever, all the pieces. And then it it comes out in electronic and or in print. And then is the idea that the writer then purchases purchases the books and then has the freedom to resell them. Is that correct? It depends on who you're working with. So for okay. us, um, the books are available on amazon.com and on barnesandnoble.com. And a lot of other places will pick them up. A lot of times Apple picks up our books, uh, target.com, walmart.com, some other places. Um, so they're available online. Um, and the royalties then come in um, from those places to our distributor, and then the distributor sends them to us, and then we uh, turn them over to our authors. Um, so that's one way that our authors can sell their books. Um, the other way is that they're allowed to purchase um, however many they want. I always just sell them at the author price. So um, usually our books cost between about $4 and $6 uh, plus shipping. So it depends on the length of the book, if it's black and white, if it's color, yeah. um, the size of the book, all those different things. Um, and they pay just the printing price and the shipping. And then they're allowed to have the books and sell them wherever they want. And I know um, every place is going to have different rules, but for us, we're like, you know, have at it, please sell your books wherever you can. If you strike up a deal with a local uh, gift shop, for example, and they want to sell your books, absolutely do that. That gives the authors so much freedom to in yeah. i think from from having been on the other side from you know traditional publishing there were only so many things that that i was allowed to do mm -hmm. and there's so someone who's got some i don't know some marketing savvy some energy to get out there and you know talk to to different groups do the library talks uh, that's a it's just it just feels very collaborative mm -hmm. to be able to work with a publisher who says, yes, I'll do this part and you are free to do this other part. So yeah, have at it. Um, so how, how does a writer submit work to Aurora Corialis? What's that um, process like? Yeah. Um, for us, we usually ask them to send their first three chapters if it's already written. Um, a lot of people we work with though need coaching or they're looking for a ghostwriter too. So um, we help them with those pieces. So if somebody comes to me and says, I don't have a book written, I was looking for coaching. And then I talk to them about what their goals are, um, what they're envisioning for the manuscript. And I see if we're a good fit. If it's somebody that I think I could help, then, you know, I may, uh, develop a coaching relationship with them. And that's another type of package that we have is the coaching clear through uh, the publication. Um, or if somebody wants a ghostwriter to work on their book, we've had books that have been written by our ghostwriter, Sarah, and they're just phenomenal. It's, it's really interesting to see how she is able to listen to someone and write in their voice. And it sounds like something that they wrote themselves, but it's all their ideas. It's all of their now, their stories, their concepts. Um, if they're teaching something, then it's all of their teachings. Um, so I love that we're able to offer these different ways that people can get their book out into the world. Okay, so that leads me to something far more current than mm -hmm. I initially was going to talk about, and that's AI. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in, if at all, with the, the ghostwriting concept? Yeah, Um so if you've written, a, if you've used AI to write your whole book, then you actually can't copyright it because you don't own it. You didn't personally write it. And you also did not pay someone to write it for you. Um, and in the case of the ghostwriter, it would be a work for hire. So somebody else wrote the book, you paid them for that specific thing. But with AI, I'm not sure completely how it works, but I believe that it pulls information from the internet. Um, so it could be other people's work that is actually embedded in your book. So it's really not a good idea to try to write using AI. Now, yeah. if you wanted to do like a chapter outline, um, or the book outline using AI, something like that would be good. Um, I think that there's absolutely a space for AI where you can use it to help bolster your creativity or help organize you, um, to help give you ideas instead of, you know, sitting here and going, oh my God, I wanted to write about forgiveness for this chapter. And I just don't know what to say. 
you know, you can turn over to AI and say, you know, what, what's being said about forgiveness? What are some ideas? And maybe get some bullet points for that. Good, good point. Yeah, that AI as a whole, it's still a, a relatively new field for the average person. And certainly in the writing community, there's a lot of very strong pros and cons. Uh, you know, we'll revisit that at another time. Yeah. So how how important is a writer's platform when you're looking at uh, accepting a writer? Does it even matter at all? Um, as far as we go, we don't consider whether a person already has a platform. Um, and just for anyone who doesn't know, a writer's platform is basically um, kind of creating what you stand for. So if you are a business coach and you work with uh, women who are new in the realm and they want to you know, start their own business, then a lot of your writer platform is going to be about, I help women, um, I help new business owners. These are the things that matter to me. Um, so that's kind of a writer platform. Or if you're a fiction author, then it's going to be um, like, I'll use myself for an example. Uh, I write women's fiction and a lot of it is about people overcoming challenges and you know becoming a new version of themselves, stepping into some new, uh, new thing that they hadn't been doing before that they you know, maybe it's their hopes and dreams. Um, so that's a lot of the stuff that I would be talking about online. And it kind of dovetails with the work that I do as a publisher. I work with a lot of the people who have been through those kind of challenges and then want to write about it. Um, so that's my writer platform. Um, I think it's important for people to have a writer platform, uh, but that's something that I educate my authors on too. I tell them, you know, these are some things that you need to be posting about online. You know, this is something you might want to do for your website. Um, we always want to be talking about our books, not just the book itself and please go buy it, but also these are some of the concepts that I talk about. This is what matters to me. This is what I find important that um, you might find interesting too. Um before a person comes to us, if they don't have any of that stuff, that's okay. Um, it's nice if it's already there, but that's also one of the things about a hybrid publisher. Um, someone like us will help educate you, will help <laughs> tell you like, hey, you know, you really need to be online. I know you don't have a website and you just have a Facebook page with 10 of your family members on it, but we need to start doing some other things. Um, with a traditional publisher, they're less likely to do that. Uh, usually you have to pitch and you already need to have some sort of an idea at least today you do, um, of what kind of marketing you want to do, um, how you're going to develop your writer platform and all those things, uh, because they want to work with somebody that's like ready to go. They don't want someone who has never been online and doesn't have a presence and doesn't really know where they're going. Yeah. It's a whole different world. Yeah. Very different world now. From the, I guess the, the, the technical, technical aspect, What's the what's the timeline for submission? Let's say let's say that here it is. We're recording this in well, for all intents and purposes, December. And let's say that I want to have a book out for the following Thanksgiving. Is that realistic? Like, what's the time frame from when I begin working with you? And let's say I've got a first draft of a manuscript. Okay. And let's say it, it's nonfiction, um, memoir, for instance. Is it realistic to think it would be out by the following Thanksgiving? For our house, yes. Um, we usually take about three to four months for a finished manuscript. And that that depends on what state it's into. So if it's just in need of a copyright, then it should be pretty quick. Usually it's about a month to edit. Um, we want to make sure that the cover is developed. Uh, we have time to format it. We have time to upload, make sure that there's no uh, errors or anything. Um, so I like to allow about three to four months. Um, if the book is um, kind of messy or, you know, if English is your second language or, you know, some other things where the book just isn't ready, it really needs more development. Um, we call it a developmental edit. So that might take a little bit longer. It could take up to two months to do something like that. Um, so that would stretch out the timeline a little bit. But yeah, if if you came to us in January and said, hey, here's a book, um, can I get it out by November? I would say absolutely, unless we've already got like everybody booked up throughout the yeah. year. At this yeah. point, we've got about, I think a third of our spots filled for the year. Um, that's another thing about hybrids. A lot of times they only take, you know, maybe a dozen. Um, we take up to 24 per year. Uh, so that's something you would have to consider too with your timeline. What kind of responses to editing have you seen? 
because I know from working with being friends with some writers, it's a matter of I write it down and that's it. I don't believe in revising, which I think is scary. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it's like, like I remember when I got my first manuscript back and this was back when there were sticky notes and every place that the, the editor had wanted to change, she had a sticky note on it. I, I opened the box and this was way back when they weren't electronic files. And I opened that box that had my manuscript. It had so many sticky notes sticking out. It was like the spine was all, or the, it was all yellow. And uh, th yeah, that was a real education. So what do you find? Had, what's the gamut of the kinds of responses writers have to being edited? Um. So I've actually started out by giving our new authors a letter that talks about how, how you work with us. And one of the things I touch on is the editing, because I want them to understand that your editors are ally. That's not right. telling you that you're wrong. They are working with you and you both have the same goal. And I think that's an important thing to keep, keep in mind is that the author and the editor have the same goal and it's to put out a phenomenal manuscript. Um, the editor is not circling things and telling you you're wrong. And I think we get that from years of, uh, you know, taking English classes in school. We think that we're wrong when we see all those red lines, but really it's just saying, hey, you know, this is a suggestion. Um, maybe I didn't understand this. This is an opportunity for the author to look at it from someone else's perspective. Okay. Um, go ahead. And to rethink, rethink decisions. I think that 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 feeds into it. I remember, I, you know, we always remember the bad, the bad things, the bad comments. But I remember in my first manuscript, the editor had a note on the margin that was I had a secondary character in the book, and I had said something where the the hero in the story was commenting to someone else about the secondary character, and said that he was a great man, and and, and he was he was he was kind of wimpy and shy, and and he had done something that was very brave. Uh, especially for him. And the editor put a note on one of those stickies and said, a great man, a good man, a good man. Yes. A great man, question mark. I think not. And I thought, oh, oh, that just, I don't know. It, it, it stuck in a way that even after all these years, I mean, that book came out in like 1993. That was a long time ago, but I still remember that. But it also made me think, what did I consider good versus great? You know, you, 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 you could still, as the writer, still stick with whatever the original was, but the comments from the editor encourage you to look at things with a different perspective. And I think that's so valuable. Yeah. Um, I want to go back something you were just talking a minute ago about the covers. Does the, does the author have any input into the, the cover, any approval process or anything like that? Um, with our house, yes. <laughs> and I keep saying that because I want to make sure that it's everybody understands it's different with each yeah. house. Um, with us, you work together with the cover designer. Um, actually, <laughs> funny story, I have one of my books here. Um, this is The Treasures We Seek. This book just came out this year. And this is the second cover that we did for it. The first one, I gave her some suggestions and I had this vision in my head of what it might look like. And then when she sent it back to me, um, it was a cool cover and it was definitely mysterious. Um, it had some sand and it was blowing across like a mosaic and her hand was brushing off the mosaic um, so she could see it because the story takes place in Italy and they're, uh, they're looking at some ruins and there's a mosaic on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so she's brushing off the mosaic with her hand. And I looked at it and I was like, it's just not it that's not the cover. And I went back to her and I said, you know, these are things I like. These are things that I don't care for. I'm wondering if we could maybe have her on the cover, have the main character instead of just having her hand. I think that that's going to speak to more people. And she agreed with me and she went in and she found some other things, reworked it based on what my comments were. And that's how we came up with um, my character, Kenzie. Um, she's you know, a uh, stock photo. <laughs> um, and then the picture in the background is Castle Gandolfo. And that's the city where the uh, the book takes place. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple different versions on that. Sometimes it'll be, um, you know, you talk to the cover designer and bam, we got it right off the bat. Mm -hmm. and that was perfect. But other times, you know, you'll have a couple different versions. And um, for us, 
you know, you feel guilty if you're, you're like, oh my God, I don't like that. Um, <laughs> but the cover designer is used to hearing different opinions. And again, it's two different people. You're going to have two different ideas. Um, what I think is important in this case is to work with your vision, but also understand that the designer is supposed to have a vision for marketing the book. Um, so if you come in and you're like, man, I really want a cupcake on my cover. She's going to ask you why she's going to say, okay, how does this work yeah. with your theme? How does this work with your market? Is that going to attract the people that uh, you want to read your book? In my case, the cupcake had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I could tell her I want a cupcake. She's going to tell me, no, that has nothing to do with your story. We yeah. really shouldn't put that on there. Um, so I do think it's important for people to have a good communication with their cover designer. Um, and I love that our authors are able to sign off on the cover. It's not just our designer and me saying, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, the author has to like it too. Yeah. That's something that the writer rarely gets yeah. in traditional publishing, unless, you know, unless you're at the top, top, top of the right. list. That leads me to um, a sensitive question, I think, and that I think this applies to writers who are being traditionally published and who are self-publishing and who are working with a, a hybrid publisher. And that's about expectations. You know, we hear social media is so full of stories about, oh, the overnight success and this went viral and this sold, a, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies. Talk to me about what you see from writers with, on one end of the spectrum, unrealistic expectations about sales, money, fame, uh, all that that goes with it. I'm going to quit my job, and um, and then on the other end of that, on the opposite end, the whole idea of getting your book out there. This really can be the fulfillment of a big dream. So. I think it's important to understand that, yes, you can absolutely eventually quit your job and all these things, but you have to have so many things in place to be able to do that. Um, and first, it starts out with that author platform. You've got to be online. You've got to be you know, doing something um, aside from just putting the book out there and crossing your fingers. Um, a book isn't going to sell itself. And a lot of times now, people want to connect with the writer. They want to know who's behind it. They want to hear what your dreams are. They want to hear a little extra about a character. Um, they want to know what your process is. Um, you can put all of that stuff online and start attracting people. Um, a lot of the authors that we work with are also speakers and coaches. So those people are using the book for their business. So they're using it to um, attract speaking gigs. They're using it to attract clients. Um, so they use it as a piece of a business that's already existent in most cases. Um, so something like that is just a, uh, a credential. Um, and sometimes they do sell thousands. We have a couple authors who have sold thousands of copies of their book. And it's because, um, first of all, there are two of them. So that helps a little bit with, you know, being able to promote and lean on each other, but also they are selling them whenever they go and speak. They're also, um, you know, using that to, uh, uh, to go to different venues. Um, I know we had a book festival in Pittsburgh and one of those authors got a table at that book festival. She went there, she met people, um, she ended up selling some books, but she also made connections. So the book is a way to make connections too. For fiction authors, it can be a little more challenging, but I think it, if, excuse me, if you have a couple books, especially, then people start discovering your books. Um, you know, I put out a book last year and I put out a book this year. Um, that was my ninth and 10th books. And then some people will see, okay, you know, you've got these, well, what else do you have? And they'll go back in and read older books. Or um, I've had people come to me and say, you know what, um, you did the editing on this book. I'd love to talk to you about editing my book. So there are lots of different ways that I use books in my business. Um, and, you know, eventually I do want to be able to, uh, have people know who I am and have people love my books, but it does take time. Um, and I think that uh, authors sometimes don't realize how much effort goes into it. I do a lot of interviews. I do a lot of reach outs and I get a lot of no's also. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, that's just part of the process. I, I I really wish that that writers who are just starting out, I really wish that they understood that's, that's part 
those rejections are, you know, showing that you're in the game, that you are really participating, that you're serious about what you do. Um, so, yeah. What, let's talk for a minute about the kinds of books that your publishing company, Aurora uh, Corealis, what kind of books do you in general uh, put out? And is there anything that you don't accept? Yeah, our sweet spot is transformational stories. So like I said, mostly coaches and speakers, um, a lot of nonprofit leaders or um, people who are maybe C-suite in their business, but they're also looking to uh, bolster their personal career. Um, those are the kind of people that we typically work with because they need a book to help provide, you know, credentials for them, um, something to help them get the foot, get their foot in the door if they want to speak at a conference or something. Um, and then we also publish some fiction, but it's something that's really well written, strong themes. Um, a lot of times, uh, like the books that I write, it's stuff that, um, you know, people are going through big challenges in their lives. So again, it's transformational, but it's fiction. Um, so it's, it's similar types of stories, but it's speaking to a different audience. I recently, thanks to my daughter, discovered the value of audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I had resisted them for the longest time. I just thought I can't listen and do something else at the same time. And yet, and now I realize, oh, duh, that's, that's exactly why they're so great. I can be, you know, sewing or doing beadwork or something and be listening to an audio book. Is audio in the future for your publishing company? Uh, we have a partner that we always refer people to for audio books. Um, it's not something that I personally handle. And honestly, with as much as is involved with uh, just publishing, the books. I'm not sure that's something that I want to even look at for the next couple of years, at least. Um, yeah. I'm also not somebody who listens to audiobooks. I tend to sing in the car and when I'm <laughs> at my house, um, you know, I have small children. So a lot of times they want to tell me their stories and I'm listening to them. I don't get a lot of opportunity for quiet time, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to say what could happen down the road, but at least for the next couple of years, probably no yeah. audiobooks for us. If an author, if an author had her book with your publishing company and decided she wanted to, she wanted to create her own audio book, you know, just doing it individually, is that okay? Like, are there any restrictions like in your contract of, well, you can do this, this, and this, but you can't touch something like an audio book? Yeah, um, we actually have something in our contract that says you are allowed to do an audiobook with your book and that we have no claim on any royalties or losses from it. Um, because we want to make sure, again, that our authors are able to sell as much as possible. And if they want to go into audiobooks, absolutely. Um, the only restrictions that we have are that um, so because we work with a lot of coaches and speakers, a lot of times people want to give away like a chapter of their book for free. So I have a clause in there that says, you know, you're allowed to do that, um, but you can't just keep giving away pieces of the book for free because it's really not fair to the people who are purchasing the book if you keep giving away chunks for free. So you can give away one chapter for free. You can be quoted in other works. Um, you know, of course, the fair use sort of thing is okay too, but uh, you don't want to give away your whole book online to people. If you're donating books, cool, but yeah. yeah. What are you looking for now? Um, we're always looking for people who have a great story that they want to get out to the world. Um, again, mostly coaches, speakers, nonprofit leaders, um, people who have a transformation that they want to share so they can yeah. impact others and help others grow and, um, you know, make the world a better place. On that very optimistic note, and I share that energy with you, uh, Corey Wamsley, thank you very, very much for being a guest on page one today. You've given us a lot of really helpful information. And I have no doubt that there are writers in the audience who are going to be taking notes and will want to contact you. What's the best way for them to reach you? Um, our website is auroracorealispublishing.com. And I'm also on uh, a lot of social media. I'm on uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram um, as Corey Wamsley. So I'm happy to talk to anybody who's interested. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And because this is page one and it's all about writing, I love to close this show with a quote from the late fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin, who said, there have been civilizations that did not use the wheel 
but there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. So find your story, find a way to tell it, and join me again next time. Thank you.